almost all the Earth's surface is now bears the mark of some kind of human impact. Severe global crises from climate change and environmental damage to species extinction, hunger, poverty, disease, and antibiotic resistance, all of these have direct connections. There was another factor that was going undiscussed, but this was the elephant in the room no one wanted to talk about. We're now over the line. Without addressing uh, what we eat, we simply won't make it. We are running out of time. This is gonna have to give. Our diet is taking us to an abyss. We've spent the last four years traveling around the world, filming the stark reality that people now face from the threat of ecological collapse. It's now become very clear to us that there's one thing driving the destruction of our ecosystems faster than anything else. Let us show you how this very same thing might just also be our salvation. and environmental scientists warn that we are fast approaching the point of no return if we don't make a substantial course reversal. We see really serious catastrophic effects in the next few years, certainly in the next decade or two. The world will be com completely different from the way it is now. Since 1900, we have seen a dramatic increase in worldwide weather-related disasters. There have now been four times more weather-related disasters in the last 50 years than in the previous 100. We began to work together to move this issue onto the global center stage. There was a lot of discussion about the contribution from uh, buildings and from industrial factories, uh, but I became aware during that same period of time that there was another factor that was going undiscussed and that is the role of animal and agriculture, which I could see was playing some significant role around the planet. But this was the elephant in the room no one wanted to talk about. Whatever environmental issue you want to look at, from you know, species loss to water pollution to water use to climate change, animal agriculture is one of the top causes. The critical widespread negative impact of animal agriculture on our planet is undeniable. Severe global crises from climate change and environmental damage to species extinction, hunger, poverty, disease, and antibiotic resistance, all of these have direct connections to animal agriculture and the massive inefficiency of our current food production systems. A report published by WikiLeaks as far back as 2009 exposed the conversations between Nestle executives and US officials called the Tour de Horizon. The Nestle executives said that their own research had shown that the world was set to run out of fresh water within the next 30 years. It stated that one of the greatest reasons for our detour down this catastrophic path is the global demand for meat products. If you look at the, the impact that food choice has on, on global warming, it's very significant. Eating meat is huge for global climate. And that's something where personal choice is the determining factor. So there's the only case I can think of where individual human choice would have a big effect would be uh, food. We're now over the line. And the idea that we're going to double meat production between now and 2050, this is just unsustainable. This is going to have to give. Our diet is taking us to an abyss. A significant reason why livestock production has been having such a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions is because of the large surfaces of forests that have been destroyed in order to make room for pastures and for the uh, growth of soybean and maize uh, for feedstock production. Our forests were once full of the most incredible life. In more recent years, we began to grow an insatiable appetite for meat and dairy. And as our demand for more meat grew, we needed more and more land. 
So we slashed and burned our way through the pristine forests, destroying everything in our paths to make way for the animals we desired to eat. As these animals weren't allowed to roam free as they naturally do in the wild, their grazing areas soon became empty. And so, of course, we needed to feed them. So again, we slashed and burned our way through more and more forests, sowed the ground with genetically enhanced corn and soya, and then doused it in pesticides, herbicides, and synthetic chemical fertilizer. Animal agriculture has literally changed the face of our planet. The Greenland is used for human crops, a great area that spans the globe. And yet the land we use for animal agriculture, shown in red, now occupies vast amounts of our Earth's land, a far greater area than that used for human crops. Almost all the Earth's surface has now bears the mark of some kind of human impact. And most of that is livestock production. Agriculture has transformed the planet like nothing else. To produce milk, we farm an area about the size of Brazil. To produce beef, we farm an area about the size of Canada, the United States, the whole of Central America, Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador combined. To produce eggs, we farm an area the size of Sweden. To produce aquaculture feed, an area about the size of the UK. A plant-based diet would reduce the amount of land required to produce our food by 3.1 billion hectares. That's an area the size of the entire African continent. The Amazon is the world's largest tropical rainforest. This ancient and richly biodiverse world is slowly being replaced. It is often assumed that much of the soy being planted in Brazil is for human consumption. In fact, less than 6% of the soy grown across the globe is fed to humans. The vast majority is grown to create animal feed for livestock. The soy is exported all around the world and fed to the billions of chickens, farmed fish, pigs and cows that we eat each day. The forests are not only home to millions of species of wildlife and plants, but are also great regulators of our planet's atmosphere. Day by day, they slowly breathe in the carbon dioxide, whilst producing billions of tons of fresh oxygen for our air. Each year, an estimated 18 million acres of forest are lost, which is roughly the size of the country of Panama. It is thought that about half of the Earth's mature tropical forests have now been destroyed. And some scientists have predicted that unless significant measures are taken on a worldwide basis, by 2030, only 10% of the forests will remain. The millions of square miles given over to growing feed for the animals we eat are heavily sprayed with nitrogen fertilizers. The nitrogen runs off the fields, working its way down rivers and eventually into our oceans. The nitrogen-rich water stimulates massive overgrowth of algae, resulting in algal blooms so large they can be seen from space. The algae starves the water of oxygen leading to the death of the marine life around it. Since the demand for meat has grown, these low oxygen dead zones have been steadily growing and growing. There are hundreds of dead zones that have developed all around the coastlines of the world. And Okay, people say, that's, that's too bad for the fish. So sorry, fish. But we need to understand that what we do to the ocean, we're doing to ourselves.
I want others to see and, and to see for themselves. This is all we've got, this little blue miracle. It is believed by some that switching from eating meat to fish will have a beneficial effect on our planet. This simply could not be further from the truth. If the ocean dies, then we humans would probably die with it, as every other breath of air we take has been created by our ocean. As reported in the leading science journal, Nature, we have lost nearly 90% of all large fish in the ocean since the 50s. One of the most in-depth studies ever carried out investigating fish stocks, also in the journal Nature, stated that at the current rate of fishing, the world's fisheries are predicted to collapse in less than 30 years. According to IPBES, the intergovernmental body which assesses the state of our biodiversity, the leading cause of marine life extinction is fishing. Our taste for fish is literally draining our oceans of life. few jobs and I was working here over the years as a diver. We used to be around the fish farms cleaning the, the dead deceased fish from the nets and uh, fixing the nets etc after storms and on occasion we'd seen some of the boats coming in to clean the uh, lice off them. It's quite a lot of dead fish, you know, diseased or they've died but it's a lot of pink mush, you know, not, 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 uh, not healthy look. Having seen what I've seen and worked on the various sites around about where I've been in Scotland, I, I wouldn't eat farmed salmon. Uh, no, would have. <laughs> pretty, pretty rank. Salmon is marketed as healthy. It's also marketed in, in, in a very devious way, deceptive way, that they think it's a wild product. So it's a fake product. It's a fatty product, it's contaminated, it's marketed as healthy, but, it, but it's not. So salmon, if you see salmon, alarm bells should start ringing. It's pretty grim when you dive down to the bottom of the cages because, you know, we always see the bottom full of dead fish. And it's basically because many of these fish are so diseased, so parasite ridden and laden with chemicals that they become sick and they live out their sad, short lives, basically looking like zombies. You know, you don't see this when you go to the restaurant or the supermarket, but this is basically what a lot of the fish actually look like before it ends up on our plates. This is the salmon farm just here. We got freedom of information data from the Scottish Environment Protection Agency showing the use of over 50 tonnes of formaldehyde, not just at this site, but other sites across Scotland, is formaldehyde may cause cancer, suspected of causing genetic defects, toxic if swallowed, may cause respiratory irritation, causes damage to organs, do not breathe. As the ocean becomes a dumping ground of seven billion people and farms saturate their fish with chemical feed, eating fish has never been so toxic. You know, our oceans have become humanity's sewers. Everything eventually flows into the sea. So if you had a, you know, time machine that go back before the Industrial Revolution, it's a different story. But now, the highest levels of many of these persistent organic pollutants, we're talking about, you know, DDT and PCBs and uh, dioxins, the highest levels in our food supply are found in the aquatic food chain. 
fish are not the safest choice anymore. So, Tony, it's great to see you. Great to see you as well. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Not at all. Thank you. A pleasure being here. So, I wanted to ask you if you could share with us what, is, what exactly it was you began to feel when you realized something was going wrong. I was exhausted more than usual. And then I was losing short-term memory, and that scared the hell out of me. And then I tore my rotator cuffs in a really intense snowboarding accident. And the doctor said, do you want to do your medals test? And I said, ah, I got my amalgams out 25 years ago. He goes, there's so many medals in the environment, you should do it. So I did, I get a phone call a week later, and I said to my assistant, just have him send the report. And he said, no, it's an emergency, he has to speak to you. And I was like, no one wants to hear that. And so I called him up and he said, Tony, I showed your blood tests, you have extreme mercury poisoning. On a zero to five scale, which is what we measure, five being toxic, you're 123. The doctor said, how long has this man been in the hospital? And I just got off stage. So I, I, I said, I can't understand this. So I, I went out and they thought, you know, maybe someone was trying to poison me because the number was so high. And I was very disciplined. I was a vegan for 12 years, and then I just went salad fish, salad fish. And they brought the medical group out here, and they looked at it, and I found this man named Dr. Shade, who's the only guy who has an ideation process where you can see where the mercury came from, and it was fish. Mm -hmm. It's been three years, um, and I had some severe moments. It burned a hole in my esophagus, and I literally collapsed. I lost a third of my blood supply. I could have died. I lost half my hemoglobin. People begin to lose their hair, yes. their memory. They lose their memories, as you were doing, as you, yes. no, as you yes. noticed. But they can also have headaches. They can complain of fatigue. Um, they can also have depression. What we're seeing now is with the toxic environmental exposure, and especially with the mercury, methyl mercury in fish, is that everyone has got to be careful because yes. the levels are going up. Udo, tell me, because your specialty is in this, how do you get the fish oils that we all need for the brain and for the body uh, if we can't have fish? What, yeah. what do you suggest? Well, we used to get them from fish oils. Yes. And, but we can actually get them from vegetables. Flax is the richest source of omega-3 that we everybody thinks should come from fish oil. If you get enough of that as starting material, your body will make what the fish oils make and it'll be clean. Many people take fish oils or have fish for the long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And you have to ask yourself the question, well, where do the fish get them from? And it turns out they get them from the algae in the ocean. They get them from plant food. So if you want the purest form of the long chain ready-made omega-3 fatty acids, the best way of doing that is simply to take an algae supplement because then you've got the purest form of it and you don't have the extra risks of having the toxins and the heavy metals and the saturated fat and the cholesterol that you would get from eating a fish. A peer-reviewed study from researchers at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego undertook one of the largest studies of fish pollutants in the world. The scientists found toxic contaminants in fish right across the planet's oceans. Nobody would go to the nearest body of water and put in like a cup and drink the water. Um, you're, you're basically getting the concentrated toxins if we're eating fish. Our scientists tell us we're now in the sixth extinction event of life on this Earth. It doesn't even make the headlines. No one even knows about it. We've had five mass extinction events on this planet in 450 million years. Let me be clear on this. The last time we had an extinction event of this magnitude was 65 million years ago. Today, over 26,000 species are currently threatened with extinction, and the most important driver of that is our use of land for agriculture. Over time, um, livestock have been a major, major driver of biodiversity loss. Some have predicted that by 2045, the species loss will be so great that we won't recover. The Earth will suffer ecological collapse, and the biggest thing you and I can do is change our diet. Some scientists have begun to call this current crisis a biological annihilation. According to the journal Science of the Total Environment from Florida International University, livestock farming is the leading cause of biodiversity loss. According to a study published in the journal Science, if the entire world were to switch to an exclusively plant-based diet, we would free up over 75% of the world's arable land, and many of the forests previously cut down for livestock farming could be restored. The 
most recent in-depth study into the environmental impact of what we eat was a peer-reviewed journal by an international team of researchers. This landmark study, headed by Dr. Marco Springman of Oxford University in England, found that in order to have any chance of keeping temperatures below the dangerous two degrees Celsius threshold set out in the Paris Climate Agreement, in high-income countries, we need to drastically reduce our consumption of meat by around 80%. Livestock emit methane and nitrous oxide. Now, most people, when they think of climate change, they think of CO2, carbon dioxide, which is a very potent global warming gas. But methane is 25 times more potent per molecule when it's released than CO2. And nitrous oxide is 298 times more potent per molecule than CO2. These are very powerful global warming gases. So today we have a very special camera um, called a hyperspectral imaging camera. And it basically enables us to be able to see gases that would be otherwise invisible to the naked eye. And today we're looking at methane gas. Methane is a gas that is being produced by cows when they belch. Methane, together with the other gases it produces in the atmosphere, has caused a third of global warming since 1750. Livestock are the largest source of methane that we can control. Steep cuts in methane emissions can slow global warming by 15 to 25 years, making it the most effective means we have to slow warming in the critical years ahead. Whoa, look at that. Wow. Of the estimated 70 billion land animals reared for human consumption each year around the world, nearly 90% are chickens. An emerging problem is that chicken consumption is now on the rise. Whilst chicken has a lower environmental impact than red meat, over 90% of chicken globally is now intensively farmed and this is having devastating effects on our planet. If we compare the equivalent protein calories for meat and plant-based proteins, such as chickpeas, chicken does less harm to the environment than commonly consumed red meats, and yet still causes 40 times more climate-related warming per calorie of protein than chickpeas, and uses 50 times the amount of water. We know that if we would shift from um, ruminant meats to other meats, then we probably would reduce um, our footprint just from, from that particular product by about a factor of 10, which is quite a bit. Uh, but if you compare that with how much you would reduce uh, your footprint if you went to plant-based products, that is a, about a factor of 100. Uh, and that's the reason why shifting to more, towards more plant-based diets has such a big impact, because we're really talking about different scales here. Organic meat has been claimed to have less environmental and climate impact. However, a study carried out by researchers at Oxford University found that, in fact, organic or conventionally produced meat has little significant difference in greenhouse emissions. So in our data, we didn't find big differences between organic and conventional across multiple indicators. What we did find is that no matter how you produce animal products, even the lowest impact forms of production still create higher emissions and use more land than typical vegetable proteins. So that's saying something really important. That's saying that even if you go into the shops and try and purchase sustainable meat or dairy, it's always going to be better to purchase vegetable proteins instead. Each year, the US government gives around $20 million to subsidize fruit and vegetable farming. But meat and dairy farming get a massive $38 billion from the government. It is now estimated that the annual cost to the US taxpayer of diseases related to meat and dairy consumption are now around $314 billion. The World Health Organization has announced that the post-antibiotic era is near. A time where a simple scrape on the arm could become fatal. Our miracle life-saving antibiotics are being rendered useless due to overuse. Not because of overuse by humans, but because we give them each day to billions of farm animals.
As our oceans and atmosphere begin to warm, the water cycles of the planet are beginning to change. Climate change changes the water cycles of the planet. The heat that's being generated is forcing the precipitation into the clouds, so we're getting more concentrated precipitation in our clouds and more dramatic, extreme, and unpredictable water events all over the world. Whilst much of the world has been experiencing increasing levels of extreme flooding, in many places, the opposite is happening. Much of the world is increasingly entering into extreme drought, destroying thousands of tons of crop, as millions of farmers struggle to find enough water for their fields. I'm definitely worried about the future of our farm. I think um, we're seeing you know, much more, uh, many more swings in climate than we've seen in the past, but we want to use uh, all the land that we have to grow food. Um, but we haven't been able to just because of the, uh, the shortages of water. It'll have an impact on food supply and prices and uh, availability. And so estimates now are between 500,000 to over a million acres of farmland that'll come out of production in California. As a result of this shift in the global climate system, the drought across Africa has deepened. Rivers and lakes that supply hundreds of millions with fresh drinking water are beginning to run dry. As new conflicts break out over these dwindling resources, we are witnessing the beginning of a mass exodus of people moving north, desperate to survive. These climate refugees are willing to risk everything to get themselves and their families to what they see as the safe shores of Europe. So one usually underestimated impact of uh, livestock production is the huge amounts of fresh water required uh, for that production to be maintained and to be increased. The problem is that in many places, uh, water is being used much faster than the natural renewal rates. Overall, in the world, uh, 1.8 billion people are living in areas with severe water scarcity. The livestock sector is the single biggest water user in the world. One third of the water use in the world is being used for producing animal products, meat and dairy. And it's not because those animals drink so much, it's really because there's a lot of water required to make the feed for the animals. If we want enough fresh water for future generations, water alone dictates that we must change our diet away from meat and dairy. All over the world, we can see evidence of a global shift towards animal-free foods that is enough to give us some hope. In 2021, a record 580,000 people signed up to the UK's Veganuary campaign, and it's estimated that there are now over 4 million people identifying as vegan across the United Kingdom. In Canada, it's estimated that 10% of the population are now either vegan or vegetarian. And in the US, over 50% of chefs have added vegan items to their menus with a 600% increase in the vegan lifestyle in the last three years. A few years ago, it was quite a challenge to get hold of good vegan food, but today we're pretty much sport for choice and there are vegan options everywhere. Tastes like a normal hot dog. Is it a normal hot dog? Like, as in, like, or is this like plant based or something? Is it... So it is actually plant based. Mm. Yeah, so everything. It's really nice. I prefer it. Because I don't really eat meat that much, so this is good. Okay. Well, I like meat in a taste good. Yeah. For not being meat. Mm. Mm. Would you be happy with that? Yeah, no. I'd be stoked. I love meat too much. So I feel like if I went plant based, I'd miss it. But if this, like, stuff tastes the same, yeah. I'd be very happy with this. I'd like you to tell me which one of these nuggets is plant-based and which one is real meat. Okay. It's very hard to say which one is... <laughs> and they taste exactly the same, honestly. These are not the chicken. No. That's interesting. But you think the second one was chicken? Yeah. The second one was actually plant-based. No way. Yeah, and the first one no was chicken. Way. Yeah. Okay, I didn't. No, I, <laughs> I couldn't have guessed that. I definitely thought the first one. Yeah, definitely. 
It seems that changing what we eat to a more sustainable diet can also coincidentally be very beneficial to our health. There is a growing understanding that we can actually prevent and in many cases even reverse some of our most common diseases all through a shift towards a whole food vegan diet. Humans can survive on many different kinds of diet, but many decades of research has now shown us that the best way of not just surviving, but truly thriving is on a whole food plant-based diet. A human can be healthy on a plant-based diet without any animal products. The major dietetic associations around the world, including the British Dietetic Association, have produced statements to say exactly that, that a diet made up of whole plant foods is healthy for humans for all stages of their lives. And not only can they be healthy, but they can restore or reclaim their health adopting a plant-based diet. So the EPIC study is the European Prospective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition. It followed over half a million individuals from 10 European countries for more than 15 years. Those in the EPIC study that were eating predominantly plant-based or eating high levels of fruits and vegetables lived longer, had lower incidence of cancer and heart disease. About two and a half thousand of the individuals in the EPIC Oxford only ate plant food, so they were vegan. Um, and even though they weren't the most healthy vegans or healthy plant eaters, you could show that these plant eaters were healthier. Um, they had a lower incidence of heart disease, diabetes and cancer. From everything we have discovered on this journey, it seems that moving away from animal foods to plant-based foods instead can not only give us a whole host of amazing health benefits, but also gives us a chance to be able to leave a sustainable planet for future generations to come. Perhaps the single most meaningful change that we can make as individuals is ultimately deciding what ends up each day on our plates. We are running out of time. The world community must acknowledge that animal agriculture is the most destructive industry on our planet. We can't wait for government policies, and other organizations to create a better life for ourselves, we need to stand up now and make our voices heard. Globally, for the typical consumer, avoiding meat and dairy is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on Earth. Without addressing uh, what we eat, we simply won't make it. This is a number one priority. This is a next step in taking responsibility for our communities, our planet, our biosphere, our fellow species. People say, what can I do as an individual? It feels overwhelming. Well, you can make individual choices. We all can. Our individual choices affect the collective choices. When you hear about airplanes and cars, and we're still gonna use those things. But the choices we make in our diet, this agricultural business where we use animals as the primary source of protein, the one thing I think we can all do is, and individuals is make our own individual choices, how we're gonna live, how we're gonna eat. Plant-based diet makes all the difference in the world. Just make some choices that are good for you, and being good for you will be good for the planet. This planet is our home. And it is up to us what happens now. History has shown that when we stand together, united in a common cause, we can achieve great things. Before us lies an opportunity to build a world in which we can thrive. But the clock is ticking. And time is running out.